Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's live broadcast, Molecular Diagnostic Solutions in a Pandemic, Planning for the 2020-2021 Flu Season with the Implementation of the EPLEX Respiratory Pathogen Panel 2. I'm Alexis Krauss of Labert, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is brought to you by Labroots and sponsored by Genmark Diagnostics. For more information about our sponsor, please visit their site at genmarkdx.com. Now, let's get started. I would like to remind everyone that this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want at any time you want during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the Ask a Question box and click on the Send button. If you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, click on the support tab found at the top right of the presentation window or report your problem by clicking on the ask a question box located on the far left of your screen. I'd like to now introduce our presenter, Dr. Heba Mustafa, Assistant Professor of Pathology and the Director of Molecular Virology at John Hopkins Medicine. For a complete biography on our presenter, please visit the biography tab at the top of your screen. Dr. Mustafa, you may now begin your presentation. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you so much for this invitation. Um, so today, uh, I was invited to talk about uh, the Genmark um, Respiratory Panel, RP2, and its projected significance um, um, in, in our workflow here at Hopkins uh, Hospital Lab and also uh, our projected significance of adding SARS-CoV-2 target uh, to the diagnostic panels um, in the middle of this pandemic we are all experiencing. Um, so um, this is my disclosure slide, and um, this is the learning objectives of today. Uh, so I will discuss um, the Hopkins lab response uh, to the SARS-CoV-2 pandemic, and sorry, and um, our current testing workflow, and also um, I would like to discuss um, the uh, expectations of the workflow during the flu season and how we could potentially benefit of panels that can include the SARS-CoV-2 targets. Um, so I will start with a little background about the virus and the pandemic. Um, so uh, SARS-CoV-2 belongs to um, a family of viruses which is called coronaviridae. Um, this family of viruses is characterized by um, being enveloped, so the particles are enveloped and the genome is a positive sense RNA. And it's quite a large genome um, um, uh, between the other RNA viruses. It actually ranges in size from 28 to 32 kilobases. Um, and the name corona stems from um, the shape with electron microscopy. Um, coronaviruses characterized by uh, those crown-shaped projections uh, that appear by electron microscopy. Um, so hence, corona means actually um, like a crown. Um, so the family uh, coronaviruses um, contains a lot of animal and bird viruses. Um, and they could actually cause severe disease in animals and in, um, in birds. Uh, however, the hum human coronaviruses that have been identified so far are seven. Um, I highlighted them here in red. Um, those b that belong to uh, alpha and beta coronaviruses um, um, uh, are mainly um, um, mammal uh, uh, viruses, and uh, the human viruses belong uh, solely to alpha and beta coronaviruses. Uh, gamma and the delta coronaviruses are basically um, uh, viruses that uh, uh, infect mammals, uh, um, uh, sorry, uh, birds, but also can infect mammals. Um, the highly pathogenic coronaviruses started with um, the very first SARS coronavirus uh, in 2002 to 2003 in China. This outbreak was limited, though, and it did not extend to a pandemic, and no cases were noted since this time. Uh, this was followed by MERS, or the Middle East Coronavirus, in 2012, that is still actually circulating, but in a small scale and in a limited geographical scale. But it has higher mortality between the three highly pathogenic coronaviruses. Then the third one is the current SARS-CoV-2, which has caused this devastating pandemic, um, that we are currently experiencing and has been causing the disease which has been known as COVID-19. 
Um, so this is the uh, current situation uh, through Hopkins dashboard, which is our dashboard we use for monitoring the cases. Um, you can see here, this is the total numbers um, of confirmed cases um, uh, worldwide, um, as well as the COVID-related deaths. Um, this, this is as of July 18th. And you can still see here in the uh, bottom right corner the curve of the increase in cases, and it is actually still going up, unfortunately. Um, so the emergence of this new source, um, I should say, was not really surprising because the studies that were done uh, after the first source in 2003 indicated that all the genomic requirements for making a new source virus already exist in bats, and it is not really a matter of if, it's actually a matter of when. Um, the virus is spread outside of China uh, was very quick for SARS-CoV-2, uh, but implementing the molecular diagnostics in the U.S. didn't start until uh, February 4th, uh, when the CDC assay uh, was um, uh, authorized uh, through the FDA by emergency use authorization. Um, and then the outbreak um, uh, was handled in the U.S. in February um, in a way um, that didn't really um, um, permit uh, large-scale diagnostics uh, nationwide. And then because of the limitation in diagnostic testing, um, the uh, criteria for presumptive diagnosis was mainly based on um, the um, um, based on the history of exposure to a known case or a travel history to China, um, and the um, the this 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 really limited the um, the availability um, uh, of uh, large scale testing and also um, the capacities of testing in the labs uh, uh, was, was limited and not a lot of information was available to the physicians back then. Um, the situation changed towards the end of February when the FDA changed the rules and they offered um, uh, or allowed the diagnostic laboratories to develop um, their own assays and to apply for their own EUA or emergency, emergency use authorization. And uh, now there is a long list of molecular assays that have received EUA. And uh, largely they are excellent in their specificity for SARS-CoV-2 testing. Most of these assays are real-time PCR methods. Um, and they target different regions within the genome of the virus. Um, the CDC panel assay uh, choose two regions within the nucleocapsid gene, N1 and N2. Uh, the WHO uh, test um, I choose to screen with the E gene and then uh, uh, follow this with a confirmation with another gene. But in general, uh, most of the available assays um, um, target two genes, uh, um, two molecular targets at least, which increases the uh, sensitivity and the specificity. Uh, so this is the genome of SARS-CoV-2, and I highlighted here um, the regions that are uh, currently commonly used in the available molecular methods for diagnosis. Uh, you can see here the N gene and E gene, but also the uh, polymerase region and also the spike genes are also used in some of the assays. Sorry, I didn't advance my slide. Sorry. So here you can see the regions that are uh, currently commonly used um, in the uh, molecular methods for diagnosis. Um, so a lot of initial concerns um, um, when the molecular testing for SARS-CoV-2 started uh, was around the clinical sensitivity of, of these assays for diagnosis. Um, after a few months of testing and after some research, um, we currently now understand that uh, the timing of the specimen collection in relation to the onset of symptoms um, as well as the specimen types collected um, are very important in determining the molecular result. Um, also, we know that the performance is usually dictated by the reagent's design, um, not really by the target itself. Um, and there might, there might be slight differences in the analytical performance. Um, so you can see here, um, for example, that um, most of the studied, studies um, so far indicate that uh, the peak of uh, the viral load is usually within the first um, 
five to six days after the onset of symptoms. Uh, we also know now that uh, some puzzling scenarios um, uh, exist, like, for example, that uh, prolonged shedding uh, of viral RNA that can extend um, to uh, weeks uh, or even months uh, after the diagnosis. Uh, you can see here uh, those are uh, three different studies uh, that has shown that uh, within uh, five to six days of the onset of symptoms, you can see that uh, this is when uh, higher viral loads are usually detected, and this is bo both in the upper and lower respiratory tract specimens. Um, I should also highlight that uh, those three different studies uh, use the different diagnostic methods that actually target um, different genes. Um, so that has been now identified as a critical um, variable in determining the result for a molecular method. And it is actually summarized here um, in that very nice uh, uh, figure uh, that is showing how the viral RNA uh, shedding uh, peaks shortly after the onset of symptoms. Uh, also, you can sh see that this is true for both uh, upper and lower respiratory tract specimen types. Um, and you can also see in, through this figure that uh, some reports also showed that um, even before the start of symptoms, uh, um, uh, the viral RNA can be detected in some cases. Uh, detection of the viral virus from um, um, stool um, uh, can also, uh, uh, or uh, was also shown, and it's highlighted in this figure as well. So really, PCR is likely positive um, earlier in the disease, and it's likely negative later in the disease. Um, the specimen type uh, is also important um, um, uh, variable. Um, so the specimens that are collected from the lower respiratory tract, um, uh, which includes both uh, BEL and sputum, among others, um, those were shown through uh, multiple uh, uh, studies uh, to maintain uh, positivity for longer than um, um, the posit positivity from the upper respiratory specimens. And some papers also showed that they might even have higher viral loads. Um, but like now, the, the use of these specimens um, is really restricted to uh, a certain population of patients. Uh, saliva is now like the, the, the huge topic um, in SARS-CoV-2 diagnostics. Uh, it's used for diagnosis um, as a promising source because it, it will assist um, if we face supply chain issues with swaps and media, and also it's, it's a nice uh, specimen for self-collection. Uh, so it will be um, uh, uh, better for large-scale diagnosis and screening. And it has been shown now through, the, uh, through multiple papers that um, uh, the virus can be detected in saliva. The sensitivity appears lower than the nasopharyngeal swabs, though. Um, um, however, um, um, it's, a still, it's a still a promising source, and some labs have started already to offer saliva for testing. Uh, other sources uh, also include self-collected nasal swabs, also have been or are considered for diagnosis. Uh, but uh, so far, the gold standard for molecular diagnosis of SARS-CoV-2 and for comparison um, has been the nasopharyngeal swab. Uh, so now I will start talking about our response um, at Hopkins and uh, uh, what was our uh, response to this pandemic. Uh, so in the, in the beginning of the pandemic, um, uh, as many other labs in the States, we were uh, quickly trying to validate um, a method for diagnosis. Um, and we started with um, uh, uh, an assay um, uh, or reagents that were provided by Altona Diagnostics. And this was our first assay, uh, which we um, applied for an EUA4, and we went live with this assay on March 11th. Uh, but quickly then, uh, we realized um, that there is an urgent need for building redundancy and testing uh, for the agent's supply chain uh, and also to try to build uh, re uh, redundancy in the gene targets of the uh, assays that we use. Uh, also, we needed some assays that can offer a quicker turnaround time for a certain population of patients. Um, so we quickly validated additional methods, and also we brought in uh, different high-throughput platforms. Uh, so by the end of March, uh, we were actually running six different assays. 
and currently we are running nine different validated assays. Um, and um, uh, those assays, that, as you can see here in this table, um, they differ in the target genes, they differ in their throughput, and uh, they differ also in their turnaround time. Um, and this is uh, the volumes we have been testing. Uh, on, this is up to July 11th. Um, so our testing volumes uh, fluctuates, but uh, they keep currently trending up. And uh, uh, we uh, we uh, ran an, a, at an average of uh, 652, but now we we test um, around 1,500 per day. Um, and our positivity rate, um, uh, those started to decline. Uh, um, uh, we we started to see it ramping up again. Um, sorry. Uh, so now that we built this redundancy in, uh, in testing platforms and testing assays, uh, it was very important for us to also um, build um, an algorithm um, of ordering. Uh, it's also, again, because of the supply chain and the difference in, um, in the capacity of the reagents between different um, assays that can run as a stat versus those that can run batched. Uh, so we built this um, algorithm uh, of ordering through through uh, like um, a series of questions. Uh, this was um, with help from uh, the ID team, Infection Prevention, Epic, and here in the lab uh, to help assign the test priority um, and to determine which assays we will run as a stat or as an urgent. Um, uh, so the stat testing uh, those we reserve for the ED. Uh, labor and delivery and in certain situations. And then we have an urgent category uh, where uh, we can uh, still prioritize testing, but this will not be run um, uh, on our stat platforms, which are mainly the Gen Expert and the Acula. Uh, but the urgents will be batched and will go to the, uh, our uh, um, quicker platforms, including the Eplex and uh, the Nemodics. And then uh, everything that can wait will be also batched and run as a routine. Uh, although we have this criteria of testing, we were successful in maintaining our turnaround time, even for the routine testing, in an average of uh, 11 hours. For the stat testing, our turnaround time um, uh, has become now about uh, two hours. And this is from specimen collection to turning the result. Um, so we did a good job in, um, um, in our um, testing algorithm and in our uh, capacity of testing and also in our turnaround time. Uh, so this graph here uh, shows that uh, our significant part actually of our volumes, we run as a stat and urgent. Um, the, uh, again, the stat testing volumes is always dependent on the supply chain and the availability of reagents. And I wanted to show this graph here uh, to just, just as a transition on my projections for the flu testing in this, uh, in this season. Um, uh, because mainly those two categories uh, include those symptomatic population and the volumes um, I'm expecting to see um, uh, uh, that will require orders for SARS and flu. Uh, so we can only project um, uh, what will happen uh, this flu season uh, based on what we know. Uh, so we know that so far that both uh, flu and SARS can cause very similar symptoms. Um, clinically, maybe there might be some distinctive criteria uh, um, uh, that can be unique to either one. For example, COVID uh, can, pre can present with a change in taste or smell. Uh, and the development of symptoms after exposure may be delayed for up to um, 14 days. Uh, however, um, uh, we would expect um, that testing will be needed to, to differentiate and confirm a diagnosis between the two. Um, um, so there is um, um, a, a really nice table on the CDC website uh, for the differences between, clinically between the two viruses if you are interested. Um, also, we know this season will be different because we know that uh, SARS virus um, uh, is already spreading in the community significantly, and we are expecting that both viruses will be circulating in the fall and in the winter. 
and there is a possibility of co-infection, uh, the extent of which is not yet known, uh, but this is expected. Um, so based on these expectations um, and based on what happened um, um, when we started um, testing um, for SARS back in March, uh, we can just uh, try to expect what will happen. So um, when we started testing uh, for um, COVID-19 in March, this coincided with the end of the past flu season. And um, um, you can see here um, that this is, um, this is our uh, flu testing uh, here on, on the top. And uh, when this, this testing, testing period, which started in March for COVID-19, uh, coincided at that time with the end of the flu season because we peaked in January and in February and we started to decline at that time. However, what happened was that um, um, the testing for COVID at, in this month uh, started as an algorithm. So it, the testing started with flu, uh, and then uh, if, if the patient was positive for flu, uh, they didn't get tested for SARS. This was really based on um, uh, the idea that uh, SARS, was, uh, SARS community spread was, mi was minor and it was rare to find. And this, this, this is really what caused this peak uh, in flu testing in March that you can see on the graph, and uh, which was even um, a, high, a little bit higher than our peak in the flu season. Uh, so we are expecting that um, this will be different um, um, uh, this, for this flu season. Uh, and uh, I'm expecting that um, uh, all the flu orders will be both for flu and SARS-CoV-2 uh, because now that we know that both viruses are actually circulating and it is not, um, um, maybe even the SARS virus uh, might be um, uh, of higher positivity than the flu virus in the beginning. And, uh, w and I'm expecting that um, this will be ordered for the symptomatic population. Um, and um, that um, this symptomatic population will come from both um, the stat, urgent, and routine categories that I just discussed. Uh, in this context, then, um, if we have uh, panels that can uh, combi combine the two targets, there, this will be very valuable. Um, so I'm still expecting that the extended panels will be ordered for our hospitalized patients severely ill or immunocompromised, as I will discuss in a minute. Um, but still, we will need um, a standalone source assay uh, for asymptomatic screening and for certain other situations. Um, so this is the flu testing algorithm based on the CDC. Um, and the guidance actually give an option for uh, diagnosing clinically in certain situations and also offer guidance on when and uh, when to offer uh, testing for flu. Um, and this is what we uh, uh, actually do in a flu season. This is our testing algorithm for flu. Uh, we have two different assays that we run for two different populations of patients. Uh, so we run the, uh, the smaller panel uh, uh, of, from gen expert, uh, the CEFIAD, uh, for um, significantly more patients uh, who are really outpatients or ED that are not very sick and they are not admitted or uh, of, no, of no high risk. And we run the extended respiratory panels um, uh, for inpatients uh, or any uh, severely sick patient uh, in the ED that will be admitted, and also for um, immunocompromised patients. Um, so the question is now, um, how will uh, a SARS the SARS-CoV-2 pandemic change this testing algorithm this fall? Um, if there is a surge in COVID-19 cases, which we expect now to happen based on what is happening nationwide, um, are we expecting then to see um, uh, an increase in the requirement for the extended panel, um, uh, which might be then preferred because um, we will be expecting to see an increase in hospitalization or severely sick patients? And then including the source to target to our already existing panel will then dramatically improve our workflow. Uh, so I wanted here to mention that there are currently three, um, uh, or at least this is what I'm aware about, 
uh, three EUA panels that has uh, combined uh, SARS and flu testing in their panel um, that include the CDC, BioFire, and Kyogen. Um, uh, we in the lab, as I mentioned, um, uh, we already have the EPLEX panel, um, and we were thrilled that they also developed a new panel uh, that, that added source to CoV-2 test, um, and we currently can run uh, under their pending EUA. And we finished evaluating the test, and I will briefly discuss our experience with this panel. Um, it was also great. Uh, um, I was happy to see that they did this equivalency studies um, that also showed that um, their new panel uh, is equivalent to the respiratory panel one or their uh, older panel. Um, uh, so this will help us also to uh, transfer our already validated sources to the new panel without the need for extensive validation. For example, we already validated um, uh, BAL uh, uh, to use on, on the panel, so we can then just do a bridging study um, and do the same. Uh, and, and here, uh, it's, uh, highlighted in the figure, are the targets that co-amplify with the SARS-CoV-2. Um, this includes adenovirus, uh, flu, and um, uh, flu A and flu B. Um, and they conducted those performance characteristics um, uh, to show that uh, adding the source uh, target to the assays didn't really uh, affect the performance. Um, and uh, then all the other targets were not really changed. Um, so because um, uh, the new panel is really then basically a combination of the SARS-CoV-2 standalone test from, um, uh, from Genmark, as well as the extended EPLEX panel, um, I will just briefly talk about our experience with the two assays uh, before I get into the new panel. Uh, so the EPLEX uh, SARS-CoV-2 assay uh, was one of the first assays uh, that we implemented in the lab. Um, this was along with our Altona and the CDC assays. And our first studies uh, showed that uh, the analytical sensitivity of this assay was comparable to the CDC and the Altona assays. Um, uh, this study was done uh, mainly by via contrived uh, RNA because at that time we didn't have access to many um, um, clinical materials to really use for our validation. Um, and when we did the agreement using clinical specimens after we implemented the assay, this assay, um, uh, the EPLEX assay for source, um, showed 100% agreement with the Altona assay, which we were currently, uh, or at that time, it was our main assay running. Uh, so in this table, uh, this is the positive agreement, but we also had 100% agreement uh, on the level of the negatives, uh, which I'm not showing here. Um, then we did also um, an analytical sensitivity study to try to understand how all our assays um, perform. And as a part of this comparison, uh, we also tested the Genmark EPLEX uh, source assay and uh, the analytical sensitivity using a quantified material, uh, clinical, clinical specimen actually by digital PCR. Um, showed uh, equivalency in its uh, sensitivity in comparison with our uh, other uh, um, commercial and closed systems. Um, then uh, when we implemented the extended respiratory panel, which we did um, at the end of 2019, uh, and we started using this panel now for about seven months, um, a switching from um, our older panel um, to the EPLEX panel, uh, significantly actually improved our turnaround time um, uh, from uh, an average of 27 hours to 6 hours. And I should say this time is also even better right now. This comparison was done shortly after implementing the panel uh, where we were actually um, still um, uh, optimizing our workflow. And also in this table, this is our usage of the panel. And um, um, I'm going to also show um, it here. Uh, so um, our usage of the panel initially after we went live um, uh, was in the average of about um, 1,200 to, to 1,300 per month. And after starting to test for SARS-CoV-2 or with the start of the pandemic, we noticed that uh, the orders we received for the extended panel uh, um, uh, went down. 
And then you can see here also our usage of the SARS-CoV-2 EPLEX, uh, EPLEX test um, and how it started to increase gradually um, between March and June. And this was uh, uh, basically because of the uh, supply chain from the company. They started to ramp up um, their production lately, and this coincided with this increase. And I should say this has helped with uh, our testing for the, our urgent category. Um, now, the, the SARS-CoV-2 assay from the EPLEX um, versus the, um, the panel or versus the extended respiratory panel workflow the, the workflow, the, the first workflow included um, uh, a, an initial step that required um, adding uh, the specimen to a sample delivery device um, and then loading this uh, into the cartridge, which is shown here on the top. Uh, now they changed their workflow a little bit to, uh, to uh, get rid of this step of adding the specimen to, the, um, to this um, sample delivery device. And you can now, um, uh, through this workflow, be uh, add the specimen directly to the cartridge. And they um, uh, noted that uh, actually the limit of detection is improved uh, using this workflow. Um, and uh, uh, um, the sensitivity is better. Um, so this is uh, better explained in this slide. Um, so you can see that um, the workflow, which starts with um, getting your specimen ready um, um, and then uh, um, loading the specimen directly into the cartridge and loading this directly into the machine, getting rid of these bottom steps um, that uh, included adding the specimen to the sample delivery device and then vortexing and loading into the cartridge. So the, we calculated the, the hands-on time right now and our average is 29 seconds. Um, I think uh, the first workflow was around one and a half minutes. So this is by itself is a little bit of an improvement and uh, especially that it's also adding an enhanced sensitivity. Uh, so the clinical performance evaluation uh, of the EPLEX respiratory panel 2, um, uh, which included the SARS-CoV-2 um, target into the uh, extended panel target, um, um, was done um, now that the company did this equivalency studies and they showed that the panel is not really affected or the targets were not affected by adding the source target. Uh, but this was also confirmed by some clinical performance evaluation studies uh, where they uh, tested some samples um, um, that were mainly nasopharyngeal swabs. Um, and um, um, uh, the uh, comparator methods were uh, EUA approved assays for the source target. And um, then the comparator method for the other RP2 panel targets was the EPLEX RP panel, which is the older extended panel. And you can see here um, in this table um, that uh, they here focused on showing the clinical performance of the uh, RP2 targets that co-amplify with the source target, which as I mentioned include adenovirus, influenza targets, and um, uh, uh, influenza, influenza A targets, and influenza B. And uh, an, an equivalent performance uh, was shown between RP2 panel and RP1 panel. Uh, and also they did a limit of detection study for the SARS-CoV-2 target and, and the sensitivity uh, was shown to be uh, uh, about 250 uh, genomic copies per ml. Um, this was done uh, by testing um, uh, about 20 replicates per concentration, um, uh, and this was the lowest concentration that was detected in at least 95% um, uh, uh, at, uh, of the time. Uh, now, this is our own data from Hopkins uh, evaluating uh, the RP2 panel. Uh, so we did an agreement study where we compared the performance of the RP2 and RP panels, uh, and we tried to test as many targets as we could. Um, so in this table, um, we noticed 100% agreement for um, these targets um, um, uh, that uh, we have tested, um, and uh, these targets were uh, frozen or the specimens were frozen um, uh, after diagnosis with uh, RP1 uh, panel. 
And also, we did a small analytical sensitivity for um, the SARS and flu AB targets. Um, and uh, this was done um, using either fresh or frozen specimens. And we tried to span uh, the CT value range uh, of specimens that we get. And uh, uh, we, ca we, um, uh, we, showed, we showed here that um, the, uh, or confirm the, um, uh, the analytical sensitivity that was reported um, per package answered. Uh, if we just back calculate uh, based on the CT uh, threshold values here that are compared. Um, so I just wanted to touch a little bit about uh, co-infections and um, the value that this might add um, as we get into the flu season and as we start implementing panels that can also add um, the source target to um, the uh, other um, t um, uh, uh, viral and bacterial um, uh, causes of uh, infection. Um, so the presence or absence of source, as we can tell, uh, doesn't really predict that um, there might uh, be other uh, respiratory pathogens um, that are uh, causing symptoms. Um, and, um, and most individuals um, uh, that have been symptomatic with COVID-19, uh, the viral RNA in the nasopharyngeal swab, um, as was measured by the CT value, uh, as we mentioned, can become uh, uh, detected um, especially earlier during the symptoms, peaking in the few days after symptoms. Um, uh, but like if we have, if we can have the ability to uh, offer methods of diagnosis that can also um, uh, detect other um, uh, co-infecting um, pathogens, this will be very valuable. Um, Early reports from China uh, suggested that co-infection um, uh, with other respiratory pathogens was, was rare. Uh, but now there are some other studies that, um, that is showing different results. Um, there might be higher co-infection rates. Um, however, the numbers tested um, uh, was, um, uh, is not really that high yet. So um, um, uh, still more, uh, more uh, closer or closer looks to um, uh, co-infection rates with uh, SARS will be critical. Um, you can see here that um, uh, co-infection has been detected uh, with rhino and entro, uh, with RSV, and also uh, with the other uh, coronaviruses that are the endemic coronaviruses. So if we use the panel testing, um, this can also help in detecting other common pathogens and also ensure the detection of co-infections. Um, and um, it's, uh, to me, it's also an advantage um, that the new uh, uh, RP2 panel has added uh, is that the ability to distinguish between the four uh, different seasonal coronaviruses, um, uh, uh, which is of interest right now uh, in studying that, um, uh, or like this is the direction right now of different um, um, uh, studies, uh, at least we are interested here at Hopkins in looking at um, the levels of co-infection, and um, it will be also of interest um, to look at the different seasonal coronaviruses as we study co-infection. Um, so this brings me to uh, my conclusions here. Um, so um, uh, based on uh, our uh, experience here at Hopkins with starting from the beginning, uh, of the SARS-CoV-2 outbreak or pandemic, uh, uh, this pandemic has really challenged um, the, the diagnostic labs and with quick new assays implementation. And we have uh, continuously now uh, faced con uh, workflow changes um, and we have to deal with this on a daily basis. Uh, we expect that this upcoming flu season will be particularly challenging and uh, we um, we don't really have uh, yet a clear uh, idea on uh, uh, what will the order ordering look like, uh, how many uh, are we expecting. Um, uh, however, uh, we know that the multiplex um, assays that will combine uh, the SARS and flu um, will be very valuable. Of course, this will be contingent on a secure supply chain of reagents. So um, if I go back to our uh, flu testing algorithm um, here in the lab, um, we, I'm expecting that we will see a significant increase in, uh, in both flu testing and source testing. And um, 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 I, know, I know also that um, our uh, uh, 
uh, testing on the gen expert um, uh, uh, at least through the media release that they are also there will be a, an assay that combines the source flu and RSV. So on both uh, arms of this algorithm, I'm expecting a huge increase in the usage. Um, the workflow will be uh, facilitated um, uh, if when we when we implement the RP2 panel, uh, especially if we uh, think that um, the number of uh, uh, sick population and immunocompromised population might increase. So if we can meet uh, the testing requirement for both flu and RSV, so, uh, flu, flu RSV and SARS targets in a one panel. Um, uh, based on what we can expect uh, uh, from the uh, like numbers of patients that we are expecting, this will uh, um, this will really um, enhance or improve our workflow, and will help with um, our turnaround time and um, um, ease of testing in the lab. Um, so with this, um, I would like I have a huge list of people to thank. Um, uh, and I just would like to give a huge shout out to the entire uh, clinical microbiology lab here for all their efforts um, in, in this pandemic and in the response to testing and enhancing our turnaround time. And I would like to thank you all for listening and um, um, I will take any questions. Thank you, Dr. Mustafa, for your informative presentation. We will now start the live Q&A portion of the webinar. If you have a question you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just click on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen, and we'll answer as many of your questions as we have time for. So let's get started. Our first question is, our normal result time is 90 minutes. Or, or, excuse me, yes, our normal result time is 90 minutes. Why is the EPLEX SARS-CoV-2 test result time two hours? Uh, so um, uh, the timing, the time I put in here was really the time from um, the uh, test order, um, sorry, the specimen receiving until the release of the results. So I always put into account this time in between. But the runtime, I, I agree, the runtime is 90 minutes. Now, if you were to choose the most reliable test method, best match for the need to monitor possible outbreak, to monitor infection on a college campus, which would this be? Um, so this is a very difficult question. So in this context, the optimal method will be the method that can run um, uh, on uh, the best sensitivity and, the, and can accept uh, multiple specimen types and um, can uh, also be uh, very quick in its turnaround time, um, just because an action should be taken on the positive results that include um, contact tracing and infection control. Um, and it should be offered to um, accommodate um, uh, a larger scale. So it, can be, it, should be, it should be offered on a larger scale. Um, so this, this should be the optimal method. Now, do you treat pediatric populations in your emergency department differently than shown in your flu algorithm? Are pediatric emergency department providers always want a full RP panel? Uh, so I'm not, I'm not really sure if our pediatric population is treated differently. Um, so in, in based on our lab memo, um, this is the population we uh, suggested that they order the extended panel for. Um, so I, the, the, the shorter answer is that I'm, re I'm not really sure if the um, practice for pediatrics differ. Um, so I, I believe it doesn't. So Dr. Mustafa, our next question. What are the SARS-CoV targets will be in the RP2? Uh, I believe it will be the same as the source assay of EPLEX, which is the N gene. And now moving on to our next question, what is your preferred for, um, for the workflows? Um, would you be more, sorry, would you explain this question? What, 
So the question that was provided, so what is your prefer for in workflows? Um, for our guests who did ask that question, feel free. Um, oh, here, we got some clarification. Uh, what is your preferred for the workflow for the SARS-CoV-2 test? Uh, the workflow for SARS-CoV-2 test as STO oh, for the whether if it's workflow A or B through the EPLEX assay is this is this question is specific for this part. So yes. I think I think then um, the workflow B is preferred um, because it reduced the hands-on time. Um, it's now uh, 29 seconds. Um, also, it got rid of one step, um, which we had to load the specimen into the specimen processing tube. So you are actually eliminating um, a step where, uh, it, uh, where, which can um, increase the chance of contamination and so on. You are reducing the pipetting steps into one step rather than two steps. Um, and also, there is an increase in the sensitivity there. So I would prefer B. We've gotten so many good questions from our audience, so we are going to continue with a couple more. I do want to remind our audience that the questions we are unable to answer today and those that come in during the on-demand period will be answered by Dr. Mustafa or Genmark Diagnostics via the email address we provided at the time of registration. So our next question, we will continue with, why do you think detecting co-infections with SARS-CoV-2 will be clinically meaningful for your institution? Um, so it will be really important uh, to understand co-infections um, um, and correlated with outcome studies uh, because this this is an area which is really um, not very uh, well uh, visited yet. Um, so uh, there are multiple um, um, groups that who are already interested and have been asking me already for um, different options for detecting co-infections. Uh, so if we have this data already available through our clinical assay, it will be very valuable. And how will the larger panel with the inclusion of SARS-CoV-2 relieve burden on the laboratory workflow this influenza season? Um, so um, if, we, um, if we assume that we don't have the SARS-CoV-2 added to the, to the already existing panel, then we will, and, and based on my speculation, that uh, a large group of the population tested for SARS will also receive an order for flu. Um, and, and, and this population of patients whom, for whom we receive the extended panel request will also order a, a SARS test. Then the timing of, and the uh, workflow will improve by running two tests, instead, uh, running one test instead of two tests. So this will um, reduce the um, uh, time to, to result, and it will also give um, the uh, diagnostic result earlier, and will also reduce our um, hands-on time here in the lab. So it will be very valuable from different uh, perspectives. So our next question, are your specimens received in VTM, normal saline, or MTM? Uh, so right now we receive specimens in UTM and we receive specimens as e swaps, um, and, and we don't as yet receive saline or NPM. Now, Dr. Mustafa, does the Eplex EUA cover different swab types, for example, nasal, or only the nasopharyngeal swab type? It's only nasopharyngeal type. Great. Now, what is the utility for you to have a panel that includes more than influenza and SARS-CoV-2 for the upcoming influenza season and beyond? Um, so I think this question brings up again to the co-infection rates um, and to the uh, population of patients uh, where uh, uh, extending the targets tested uh, is kind of required, which include the immunocompromised and sever severely sick. Uh, for also implementing um, uh, measures uh, of infection control and so on, especially if the patients will be um, hospitalized. Um, and it will be in the context of SARS-CoV-2 outbreak, especially um, important for also detecting rates of co-infection and um, to um, uh, also understand better the outcome um, um, uh, uh, within, in different scenarios. 
Now, our next question is a two-part question. Do your clinicians request retesting by a different assay if the first assay used in your lab comes back negative? Mm -hmm. And how often does that happen? And is it on the same or a new specimen? Uh, we don't. We don't usually do that. Uh, we already proved that all our assays are very comparable in their analytical sensitivity. And uh, uh, usually testing, which we, we did this in the very beginning until we were very comfortable in the fact that if a specimen is negative, it's not, it is not probably due to the analytical performance of the assay. So we don't currently do that. But we are aware that um, uh, repeat testing is ordered for um, patients, but it's not, um, it's like it's extended through different, um, like it's consecutive testing of some, some patients, which uh, has been a part of the um, new IDSA recommendations anyways for certain population of patients. But this is the only context we get on repeated testing on the same patients for. Uh, we don't test uh, a same specimen if the physician has a concern about an analytical performance uh, issue. That we don't. Great. So what are the different strains of coronavirus, and has the virus undergone mutation? Um, so different strains of the current SARS-CoV-2, or are we talking like larger so I have been uh, a part of um, uh, the sequencing um, um, initiative here at Hopkins, and we started to um, look at the strains circulating here in the area. And uh, the virus, I should say, the mutation rate is very, very low. Um, and uh, however, there are different clades. Um, um, so I'm not sure if this answers this, this particular question. Not a problem. We'll move on to our next one. Do any of your physicians request reporting the CT value with the results? Um, yes, uh, that, that has become a very common request. Um, and uh, we don't report the CT values in our reports. This is, at the end of the day, a qualitative assay. We run nine different methods, um, and uh, the, they target different genes. So it will be quite complicated to uh, uh, provide a like um, um, like a CT value in this context. Uh, also, some assays don't report a CT value, like the Panther, which we also use. Um, but we have been releasing them um, as um, uh, to the to the physicians in certain situations upon request. And um, it looks to me that they are valuable to know um, um, sometimes uh, to understand um, if if really the viral load is uh, going low um, and so on. Uh, and I think this has been um, um, uh, also like reported from like at least through my conversations with different labs that it has become a very common request. Now, did you find any co-infection of various flu in the COVID-19 patients? Uh, so we so far actually didn't have the chance to do so here because uh, when we started testing, uh, flu went down and we didn't see, I think we only had two uh, at that time back in, uh, back in th at the end of March. And right now we don't have, uh, we don't, we didn't start seeing flu yet. So I don't have an answer for this. All right, so we'll continue on with our next one. Uh, they'd like to know if the rapid test or RT-PCR is a more reliable test method for the COVID-19 detection. Um, I think the question will be uh, in comparison to what. Uh, so, so far, the molecular methods are really the gold standard for diagnosis, which includes RT-PCR, among others. Uh, the most of the available molecular methods are based on uh, PCR, uh, whether then the detection is real time or, or um, uh, most of them are real time, really. Um, and uh, um, then there are other methods that have uh, shown also comparable performance. Um, uh, so, for example, the EPLEX, which we discussed today, um, this, is, uh, this includes an amplification step. Uh, but the detection is not through real-time PCR, and still the analytical performance is very comparable to real-time PCR. 
Um, and then there are other methodologies also that have been added, which includes CRISPR method and uh, and so on. Uh, but I think the uh, the proper answer will be um, uh, that molecular methods for detection are sensitive and so far are the gold standard. Now, our next question, how does SARS-CoV-2 attached at the lungs? If you could please elaborate more on that, if possible. In the lungs? So uh, I think in the lungs, we consider this lower respiratory tract, um, and we would look at lower respiratory tract specimens. And for molecular methods uh, here in the lab, those will be bronchoalveolar lavage, where you actually are like trying to wash those deep alveoli and get the specimen from there. Or sputum, where um, uh, if the patient actually is producing sputum. So this is also considered a lower respiratory specimen type and it can reflect um, the lower respiratory portion of the respiratory tract if we compare this to a swab from the nose or a nasopharyngeal swab. Now, Dr. Mustafa, we did receive a question saying, my question would be related to expert integrated test, which would be 45 minutes max according to their announcement. Would this be a method of choice for triage? Uh, so again, it's it's uh, it's based on our algorithm of testing, and it's usually um, the main bulk of our testing is done on this platform because most of the uh, specimens come from the outpatient population or the ED, and it will be our um, if uh, if my calculations are right, um, um, uh, we will and flu and SARS are both ordered through our. Um, that urgent and routine testing, we are, I'm expecting that we will receive about 500 uh, requests per day for both flu um, and SARS that we are expected to run on gen expert. Um, so it is the to-go test in those population of patients, and the extended panel has its own population of patients. Perfect, and it looks like we have time for one more question. So why is it using an, a low plex panel like that on the Gen Expert would still be crucial when having a more enhanced panel like that of the Eplex? Uh, so it's again uh, because of what you really need in which population, and also um, um, uh, differences in the supply chain and how many you can get for each. Um, so um, in certain population of patients, uh, the outpatient, um, uh, it's necessary to test for SARS and for um, um, for influenza. If you if this will be important for the management, which it is, um, and maybe it is not as um, um, as critical to test for other targets. If you compare this to an immunocompromised population, where diagnosing another target will be also essential for di for managing the patient, like para influenza or any other target. So it's really based on the population you are looking at and the situation. It's, is it a hospitalized patient uh, where you need to start um, uh, your uh, contact measures and isolation, even if it's a para influenza or another target? This is, those are really important in making the decision on which, which, is, which test to order. Thank you again, Dr. Mustafa. Do you have any final comments for our audience? Uh, no, I, would, I just would like to thank you all again for the invitation and thank you for listening and just to stay safe and wear your mask. Absolutely. So before we go, I'd like to thank the audience for joining us today and for their interesting questions. Questions that we did not have time for today and those submitted during the on-demand period will be addressed via the contact information that you provided at the time of registration. We would like to once again thank Dr. Mustafa for her time today and her important research. We would also like to thank Labberts and our sponsor, Genmark Diagnostics, for underwriting today's educational webcast. You can view the webinar on demand, and Labberts will alert you via email when it's available for replay. That's all for now. Until next time, goodbye.